everyone, and uh, thank you for attending this session. Um, the topic of board board's role in fundraising is always a favorite of mine, and so I'm happy to be here today and on this Canada Helps webinar. Just a, a little bit of background. I've, I've been in the business, uh, well, since the 80s, but self-employed since 1991. What I want to focus on is the learning outcomes that we have today, which is identifying the challenges and benefits of board engagement, summarizing some of the best practices in the board's fundraising role, and how staff can foster that role, and providing some practical tips and tools for successful board involvement. So I'm curious, I don't know whether we've got a polling question of who's here today, um, but it would be great if uh, we got a sense and uh, found out who's here as a board member or a fund development committee volunteer and full or part-time development staff, chief executives and directors, executive directors. Well, and I don't know whether um, we're getting a poll up or not. Maybe we won't spend time on that right now. We'll just keep progressing with this because we've got a lot. Yep. Yeah, we've um, we've launched the poll, and I see oh, yeah. the answers coming in over here. Oh, excellent. Okay, because yeah. I'm not seeing them, so that's... Okay, so uh, people are submitting their answers so far. Great. Looks like Good. we're up to 40% uh, chief um, executive um, director. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have 28% board members, which is great. Great. Thanks, board members, for coming out. Uh, we're at 9% fund development committee of volunteer. And great. Um, we're getting, let's see, 34% so far full or part time development staff member. Um, we're at nine percent for other. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's fantastic. I really appreciate the volunteers that are coming and and being part of this session, and and also to staff for all of you for signing up. So thank you for doing that, and and uh, hopefully this session will be helpful to all of you. So. Part of what, um, in terms of what's the challenge, as far as the board's role in fundraising, um, the, the, the top left corner is, is around resistance. Um, the middle top is, is trying to, you know, hear no evil, see no speak no evil, and, and um, speak no evil. It's because I think a lot of times, unfortunately, fundraising is considered a necessary evil. Uh, the, the top right is trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. I think that a lot of times we recruit board members and say, you know, whether we even mention that fundraising is part of it, or a lot of times we underplay what the responsibilities are, and then we try and, and, and see whether you'll get involved. And so that's one. And then that same old way, we've always done it this way, and we're resistant about doing something new. Um, the little terrier at the bottom, of course I'm biased because I have a terrier, um, is, is miscommunication and lost in the translation. And um, unfortunately, that little rodent um, under the, the, on the road is the not my job. And then the bottom line is a lot of people, and even fundraisers, are really scared about asking for money. And I think that, that so part of that, those are the things that I've run into over the last many years of working with boards and staff. And, and I think that, that we sort of do a disservice by not preparing people better. And so what I find is that what's usually happening is that there's little or no clear communication up front in terms of board recruitment. We tend not to provide our board members with training. And, and if it's a small shop, then the training and support really um, is lacking. And then it ends up, um, you know, sort of the default for a lot of people around fundraising is let's have a special event or let's go to corporations and those two defaults unfortunately are not effective methods of fundraising necessarily because corporations uh, will always pay their stakeholders first and special events tend to be more friend raising than fundraising. 
So Board Source is a, is a, a great resource down in the states, and and they say that 60% of CEOs and 58% of board chairs identified fundraising as one of the most important areas for board improvement. Um, and I say, well, that's not surprising, but but are we ensuring that there's success and that missing piece of the puzzle around the training side of things? So as far as the benefits of board engagement, I think that board fundraising success stories really occur where planning and implementation intersect. And the planning obviously does include that training and support side. And I'm a great fan of the, of the movie Field of Dreams, and if you build it, they will come. And so I, I do believe, because I've worked with so many boards over the last 25 years, that when properly supported, in fact, people do have, um, are, are willing to uh, step up to the plate and, uh, and often will hit a home run too. So as far as board uh, the fund development best practices, I tend to say that that's board led and team driven. And and any of you that are in the field of fund development know the term a culture of philanthropy. I find that a bit of jargon, needless to say. And so you know I prefer to say it is about a team effort of everybody's involvement in order to have successful fund development. So. It's grounded in the charity's mission and core values um, that board members and, and staff that you can say we've got 100% support. It doesn't mean to have that, that you all have to donate at the same amount, but, but that, the, that the leadership is um, role modeling what we need from the outside as well. Understanding the costs of fundraising is really important. I've got a slide on that that just might help translate that a bit and that you're partnering with staff and volunteers. So it's great that we've got staff, board, and some fund development volunteers on this call. The ethical side is that it's above the legal requirements, that, that it goes above and beyond what Canada Revenue Agency states. And that strategic means that the board is setting the direction, it's goal-oriented, it's measured and monitored and revised and cost-effective if, if we really examined uh, what is the return on investment on a special event, for instance, you might find out that if you counted all the staff time invested, that in fact you lost money. And uh, so those are things to keep in mind. The donor-centered focus is about answering what's in it for the donor, what's in it for them is that T, um, as opposed to starting out and saying what's in it for us, the charity. And that you're cultivating and stewarding the relationship on a constant basis, that it is relationship-based and, and really about shared values, and that you're identifying and asking investors directly for support, because we know that one of the biggest gaps in fund development is nobody ever asked me. So as far as board member best practices, that you're understanding the governance roles and responsibilities, including the fiscal health of the organization and modeling integrity, ethical behavior, accountability, and you're respecting the confidentiality that's involved in your privileged position. That you're valuing and supporting the organizational philanthropic and learning culture. So, so having an attitude of, of, say, allocating 15 minutes at the beginning of a, of a board agenda for some professional development and, and not necessarily having someone come in that's paid, but, but each of you doing, taking a topic that's interesting and doing a little bit of research and presenting back to the board. Being mission grounded, strategic, and action oriented. We've got 87,000 charities out there, about that anyway. Not all of them are active in fundraising, but the strategic side of this is so important and that you're understanding the fundraising costs and the return on investment. And so are you examining whether we, did we make money or lose money on that special event? Where can we work smarter and not harder? Donating time, talent, and treasure on an annual basis, and I do understand that, that board members, you're giving your time, and that's so important, but what we also know is that donors, and particularly major gift donors, regardless of the size of your organization or where you are, a major gift is not to say it's always 
500,000 for, for one small organization it might be $500 and another it could be a half a million so but but major donors know the fundraising game and they do want to see because most of them have been board members elsewhere and so they do want to see that you are donating to the organization as well capitalizing on the personal connections whose contacts would be motivated by your charities so I'm not saying we want your entire address book but what I am saying is who are your friends and acquaintances your peers that where you would have shared values around the mission of the organization that you're serving on and recognizing that various skills and backgrounds will strengthen that team approach so so it's really important to know that asking for a gift is only 5% of the whole process. There's lots of other tasks that can, where you can be involved that would help the, the team approach. Telling compelling stories based on the charity's strategic priorities. So again, that's part of the staff's job is to help, help make sure that you have those stories at your fingertips. And, and what are you most proud of? Seeing that fundraising is an investment opportunity and not begging. So I think a lot of people kind of go, oh God, I could never ask for money. And yet, if you can go to people and say, this charity is doing such important work and here's some evidence of that work and we'd like you to invest in the future of this. That, that, that's a different um, approach and it's also an approach that donors totally understand. Don't take rejection personally. Um, I, I think none of us would be in fund development if we did take rejection personally, but, but it's just to know that, that if we've done good research, then, then no doesn't mean no forever. Stretching beyond your comfort level for the benefit of the cause and the population it serves and demonstrating an attitude of lifelong learning. So in terms of, of that best practices, is it is about putting your money where your mouth is and keeping your eyes on the prize and the benefits that your efforts will serve for those that, that your organization is serving. I think that's so important that that's the bottom line to all of this is that it's grounded in your mission. It is about, about increasing the ability of your organization to serve its population. So as I said, asking for a donation only represents 5% of the fund development process. So here are a few kind of fun ideas of things that I came up with. And, and just to say that, yes, you're an ambassador. That's probably one of the key roles as board members, that you're out there being an ambassador, ideally that you're a donor. Some people are, are natural planners. I, I know that you know anyone in the construction business actually has to be have a really strategic mind in terms of, of uh, you know, people that are, are contractors or designing an entire building, that kind of thing, maybe not the, the person that's, that's uh, putting it together. But thinking about what's my role as a matchmaker, who do I know that, that I think would be a good donor to this organization? The social convener is maybe the person that is about organizing the, the, the event. Um, an enthusiast is just being someone that, that is excited about the mission of the organization. That prospector and sleuth, I always say that, that prospect research is a treasure hunt and, uh, and I want to make it fun to find people that will donate to my organization. The director connector is, is are you as a board member um, in the business world and do you know uh, directors either to corporations or directors that are sitting on donating foundations and so how do we match make some of that. The cultivator is always about nurturing the relationship. Where can we develop uh, more connections? The storyteller, some people are just natural storytellers and love being able to, 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 to do the, the elevator speech. The solicitor, again, that's a pretty important role, but, but not everyone has to be out there asking for the gift. The negotiator, what I find is that if, if um, uh, we're trying to negotiate a, a, a major gift, then it is a back and forth and, and, uh, and so it's about creating a win-win situation. Canvasser, public speaker, the prompt responder, so 
the thanker and the banker. I mean, the prompt response here is is about making a phone call and saying thank you so much for your gift. I'm on the board of this organization or I'm on the staff of this organization and I notice this is the first time you've donated and I just wanted to say how much we appreciate that. Your, your receipt and thank you letter will be in the mail but I just wanted to thank you personally. The steward and the guardian again it is about nurturing that relationship. Some people are just natural trackers or statisticians that, that want to look at the return on the investment, how much time was spent. The party person might be related to the social convener. Um, I put deputy and posse just to say that, that in fact, you know, we, do, we need a whole team. So um, count, be creative and think about maybe brainstorm within your own organization about what are the various roles that would help us strengthen this whole thing and knowing that the asking is just one, one small part of it. There was a book many years ago, 1994, on the seven faces of philanthropy and, and just looking at some of the, the those ones, is, it's also reflected in the board. So who on your board likes to do good in return as the repayer or it's just good business or the social light is the fun side? So that's just another little way of looking at where do I fit in as a board member or even as a staff person or volunteer. On the staff member best practices, again, it's identifying what skills and behaviors make a successful team and then recruiting people according to the gaps and needs. Um, when I say not just a pulse, um, I'm, I'm being facetious obviously, but I get a lot of phone calls very close to an AGM saying, do I know of any potential board members that would join the board? And I want you to be strategic about board recruitment as well and making sure that you're saying, look, at, we don't seem to have anyone with, with fund development skills. We need to find that and, and recruit accordingly or, or whatever. Communicate all expectations during recruitment and prior to acceptance so, so, and that it's documented. Discuss and document what are the mutual expectations with candidates so that you're not frustrated based on a lack of communication that in fact people went into this volunteer role with eyes wide open and then translating the return on investment into strategic decisions. So that helps justify um, the what you're requesting. Providing job descriptions in terms of reference to reinforce that mutual agreement. Again, so it's just backing up what was agreed upon. Inviting and engaging board and volunteers in the priority setting and budget identification because that's where you have more of a vested interest if you've been part of that, that discussion. Identify what areas board members and others are willing to support in fundraising as well as where they're interested in learning. So, you know, some people might be um, a strategic volunteer, as I say, where, where maybe they want to increase their skills and so they're getting onto a board because they want training in a specific area. Others just want to stay within their comfort level and that's fine too, but just knowing that having everyone involved in fund development is the key to all of this and everyone I mean from the receptionist of your organization who could answer a donor's question right up to the chair of the board that that everyone has some role to play help team members understand that philanthropic culture does include everyone and and model an organizational learning culture again I mentioned that in the best practices in the board as well but but make sure that you're trying to learn something new each time training and coaching volunteers and staff regularly to build skills and confidence. So it's helping everyone understand what's necessary in order to have successful fund development and inviting feedback to evaluate the fundraising support system. So you know we may ask our volunteers to be part of a special event um, and yet or be part of identifying potential donors but we're not supporting it very well so how can we improve that? And don't expect a board member's entire contact list, but do encourage that they identify people that sh where they have shared values. 
providing necessary background research to brief canvassers appropriately. So we would never think of sending a canvasser even if they were paired up with a um, staff person on a call without giving all the background information that they need to know in order to make an effective call. So knowing about the donor's history, how long have they been supporting the organization, what projects have they supported, so, so that they're going in eyes wide open and ensuring canvassers have the tools to report back what they've learned in a cultivation or an ask to strengthen the approach. So again, maybe providing a, a one page document that just helps people then report what they learnt as a result of a, of a call. So success factors are clear, compelling purpose, direction and benefits and, and outlining the benefits to donors is an important part of all this. A strong involved board in partnership with the chief executive, staff members and volunteers, that's part of that building that culture of philanthropy or the team approach and growing a structure that encourages efficient and effective service delivery. Learning culture that's not afraid to change because I think it's impossible to have a learning culture and be afraid of change. Those two are almost a, a paradox. And financially sound and prudent strategic plan because remembering that you're competing for investor support and the more effective and efficient your organization is and that you can prove that then the more an investor will see that that's a prudent um, place to place their money and that tenacious nature and courage to ask and thank so so it's not letting go if you've done good prospect research, then you have to be tenacious in this. And no doesn't mean no forever. Um, that's something to really keep in mind. So I mentioned that I was going to just touch on the, some of the reasonable cost guidelines. And James Greenfield is, is sort of a US guru. We've, we've yet to, to come up with an equivalent in Canadian, but I think the bottom line is that, that we really can look at this and say this is a guideline. And Canada Revenue Agency is well aware of this as well. And um, if I always say that if anyone is suffering from insomnia that reading Canada Revenue Agency's uh, fundraising guidance is, um, is important for everyone to know that in fact CRA wants us to, to be honest in terms of the cost of fundraising. So direct mail acquisition, you can see $1.25 to $1.50 to raise a dollar, that's pretty scary and yet if we didn't have the acquisition side, then you know we would be constantly losing donors either through attrition or moving or or dying. And so we have to we have to have an acquisition side. But as long as you have a good strategy for renewing your donors, then the 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 renewal of their gifts um, is uh, direct mail renewal about halfway down, twenty to twenty five percent cent. Um, for dollar raised. So, but most important is that volunteer led solicitations. You can see 10 to 20 cents per dollar raised. I think the surprise to a lot of people are the, the, the fact that special events are pretty expensive to run. And that's uh, you know largely because we don't tend to count the staff time that gets invested. And Canada Revenue Agency now does say you have to count that. So board member responsibilities, again, once clearly communicated by the charity is the making a personal contribution, a stretch gift if possible, identifying and evaluating and cultivating prospects, attending face-to-face -face solicitations. Again, not everyone has to do that. Um, even the next point down, writing or signing appeal letters with a personal note. So there might be a general letter that's going out from the organization. But if you know someone, and, and we're talking cross Canada here, and I, and I know that, that in a small community, then, then we certainly bump into people either at the grocery store or the church. And, and so just a little PS at the bottom to say, um, Cynthia, this is a, a 
project that I really believe strongly in, hope you can support, is, is just such an important way of bringing that home and it also encourages um, greater commitment from, from the people you're writing. Organizing and attending special events and being available to assist with other fundraising efforts. But most importantly, around thanking donors. So one of the, one of the um, strategies, say, for a performing arts organization or a symphony or something like that, that's kind of an easy one where, um, say, donors at a concert are all wearing a carnation. And then board members know that anyone wearing a carnation, they should go up to and introduce themselves and say, I'm on the board of this organization. Thanks so much for your support. Think about whether there's any way you can build something like that in where the board members can have a personal opportunity to say thank you. So fostering miracles. Are you communicating the expectations with written backup to, to reinforce that message? And how are staff and existing board members helping new recruits determine what their role could be, what's within their comfort level? And knowing that, that you really have to have training, support, and coaching. And if you haven't provided that, then you can't expect miracles. And I think that's sort of a key thing that is really um, difficult because we just sort of hope that it's going to happen, but, but without the support then we can't expect it. So fundraisers' qualities, whether they're staff or volunteers or board members, is about impeccable integrity, that they're good listeners, they have the ability to motivate people, they're hard workers, and they've got concern for people. And so I always say that, that uh, they're, they're both champions and may be able to walk on water, but that's the sometimes the expectation is, oh, let's hire a fundraiser and we've just delegated that nasty task. And, you know, that to me is setting someone up for failure because it can't be a one person job. It absolutely is a team effort. So trying to find people that are board champions, where do you find them? Uh, movers and shakers in your community. I always say that because I travel a fair amount, um, give me a car and a camera and maybe an hour and a half and I can identify the movers and shakers in pretty much every community because I read donor walls constantly and I look at the um, donor pages in a, in a arts program, that sort of thing. So that way you see that even Toronto is a small town when it comes to donors and so you'll that's one way of, of identifying who are the people that really are engaged and one of the things as well that's that's around donors but we know that there's a fair cross uh, relation between donors and board members and other also former engaged board or staff members, people that you know you knew were active. Sometimes people will step off a board for a while and then get back on again. Committed donors. So as far as, as I sat on, on um, or I was consulting with an organization that, that wasn't very active in fundraising and the board wasn't comfortable even making a donation. And so in terms of trying to change the culture of that organization, I kind of gave up on trying to get the board members to donate and instead I looked at donors and thought who of these people might be on, join the board and then, and then help change the culture of, of an organization that had previously not been involved in fund development. Alumni canvassers of other successful campaigns. So wherever you are across Canada, we have hospitals, we've got universities, we've got United Way, we've got churches. A lot of those organizations have provided training for potential canvassers and I always say give them a rest, but, but definitely um, you know, say to them if they're on a United Way campaign or a university campaign, say, 
once you've finished this and maybe a year down the road, would you consider joining our board? Because you've got skills that we could really use. So prospects versus suspects. This is actually um, a, a cheap, from the book Achieving Excellence in Fundraising and um, Hank Rosso has since died, but, but it's a great book that is um, uh, written Chap different chapters are written by a variety of, of uh, US-based fundraisers. There is a Canadian version as well, but it's, it's a different book. And uh, I must admit, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of, of this one. Normally, I'm a, a fan of Canadian content. But I like the fact that he talked about in order to have a prospect versus a suspect, then we have to have linkage, so somebody that knows them, what there's a personal contact, that we have a sense of their ability. And I've, I've thrown in that volunteering their time, because the, he, he wrote, uh, this was about looking for donors, but I still say if you're trying to recruit um, board members, it's the same thing, because any one of you that are on this call that are board members probably got asked by someone you knew or you heard about it, so this formula still works. But most important as well is the interest. Where, do, where does your prospect's interest intersect the mission of your organization? Because you're not going to convince someone to donate their time or money if they're not interested in your cause. So a team approach to solicitation, being a horse person, of course, I love this, this reciprocity that horses do where they scratch each other's backs. And it is about you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours because that team approach is what makes a stronger request so that successful board and staff teams work together and support each other toward common goals and that you actually know what those common goals are and how they relate to your strategic plan because you do not have any kind of case for support if you don't have an active strategic plan, which is partly why I do strategic planning as well as fund development training because too often I was asked to help with fundraising and then there was no strategic plan. So it all has to be, they're all cogs in a wheel both make a personal gift first, so we know for a fact that canvassers who have made a gift themselves to an organization are far more effective than people who've never donated, but they're still out asking for money. That it is about meeting together and planning the ask, that volunteers convey their commitment and passion, and usually they may be the one that makes the ask because it does bring some credibility that they're volunteering their time. But then the staff are always the ones that, that can have some of the logistical details and serve as a backup in case the volunteer or board member doesn't actually ask for the gift. Because if you're sitting face to face with someone and someone's supposed to say, and we'd like you to make a gift of $1,000 or 2500 or 25000 and that doesn't get said, then someone's got to step in, otherwise you've wasted everyone's time. You've got to cut to the chase. So creative listening is, I, I love this, about two ears and one mouth for a reason, that it's listening with your eyes, your ears, your heart, and your time. So one of the things when we say, and we'd like you to make a gift of such and such to our charity, then the canvassers, staff and board, bite your tongue, don't say anything after that. It's going to be tempting, but just sit there quietly because that's part of then the ball is now in the prospective donor's court and it's up to them to, to be the first to speak. So why face-to-face -face requests are better is that that team really can express your own personal passion for the cause. Whenever you're ever feeling exhausted either as a staff person or as a volunteer for your charity, just say to yourself, what is it that lights the fire in my heart about this organization? Because obviously you were motivated at one point, and I know it gets tiring sometimes, but, but just always say, what is my personal passion about the cause? And that you can 
reading body language when when you're making a request and and the the prospective donor is leaning forward and listening intently that those are good signs and nodding their head I mean one call that I went on we were going to ask a donor for $50,000 and because he kept nodding his head and and listening intently we actually didn't leave the proposal with him um, and there's a great story called the flinch test and this was such a perfect example of it because the canvasser the board member that I was with said and we'd like you to give fifty thousand dollars and the guy didn't flinch and so he said a year for two years and we turned it into a hundred thousand dollar ask sometimes the opposite of the flinch test is is to say and we'd like you to give fifty thousand dollars and if the guy flinches then you say over a five-year period so that's always sort of a joke around capital campaign fundraising but this was such a perfect example that it was true and it was based on us reading this guy's body language and he made a hundred thousand dollar gift his foundation so so that was an example of it really working so deepening the relationship with the donor or prospect it's about finding out you know what is interesting to them and that negotiation part yes it's harder to say no friend to friend or peer to peer but if they refuse Again, it's about not taking it personally. So in fundraising, uh, Bernard Ross and Claire Siegel are, have written this book called The Influential Fundraiser. Um, they're it, based in Great Britain. Bernard speaks in Toronto and, and at various fundraising conferences. But ask which no do you mean? And I've, I, I have the German Shepherd jumping through the hoop because sometimes we do have to jump through hoops when we're fundraising. And it is about no, not this project, or is it no, not you, the canvasser, not me, I don't make the decisions, not unless you offer me more in return, um, in which case you have to see what is your charity's policies around donor recognition. You should have some policies in that area so that you're not giving away things that you shouldn't be giving away. Cash isn't an option. Are you offering, you know, planned giving opportunities where people could, you know, do gift of annuities instead of cash or so it's just to say that if you've done that good prospect research of linkage ability and interest, then it doesn't mean no forever. Um, you know, my best example is is I got a fundraising request one time right after I had just given the mechanic a thousand dollars and and frankly I liked the cause but the mechanic won that day because I needed my car <laughs> so so keep in mind if you've done good prospect research no doesn't mean no forever in terms of handling rejection because I think that's a biggest fear around around asking for money is do not take it personally and uh, so just um, sorry I just had my timer go but prospects aren't rejecting you or the organization it's just impossible to fully understand the personal or business circumstances and so keep in mind what you know what project might interest you if if that's a if just asking open-ended questions and and being open-minded to a conversation because it is about a, a dialogue with the donor Offering additional information, um, one of the things to keep in mind is that seasoned donors and major donors know exactly where to go look. They can go on Canada Revenue's website, they can do their own research about your charity, it's all public information. And so all the more reason for all of you as board members, as volunteers, as staff members to go and look on the Canada Revenue Agency website and make sure that your T3010, which is that public information form, is accurate because people are basing their decisions on that information and then there are other places to find that, that as well, but it's all because it's public. Can you offer the a prospect a tour of the facility or interview with a client? So if you're dealing with vulnerable clients, then you know choosing a graduate rather than an active client providing a copy of the budget or that sort of thing. 
So secrets of success are about the mission and goals of the organization, the interests of your prospects. Remember that's what's in it for them and how to ask for support and how to overcome your own fears about the ask because if you don't ask you won't receive. We know that for a fact. We If we just um, hope that people will donate because you're doing good work and you're not asking, it doesn't work. So I've got some online resources, we've got some time for questions and uh, just to say there, I, I was um, the author of the Charity Village articles for four years so there's quite a, a selection on Charity Village, also um, encouraging fundraising savvy boards. That third one down, Andrea McCamus, is um, a colleague that's written a great um, document on the board's role in fund development and again just some some more information there if you haven't discovered the movie Mondays they're little clips that are quite useful and then that board source as well thanks so I want to leave you as okay sorry go ahead I didn't mean to okay interrupt. I just that's okay. I just I, I, I would love to hear from anyone on this call or people that are listening to this later that don't hesitate to email me. I'd love to know one change you intend to make as a result of this webinar um, because it is about making change in order to have um, an active team effort. So I'll leave that with you then now, Cindy, and you can and uh, take over. Thanks. From here. Thanks so much, Cynthia. I, you know, I really um, liked the idea of the flinch test. That's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, yeah. It's amazing that that works, and it, well, it makes sense that it works. Why not meet <laughs> the person halfway, right, and turn around yeah. a no to a donation when maybe they're willing to um, to meet you halfway? Well, in, in this case, uh, we doubled the gift instead of meeting us halfway. <laughs> so <laughs> That's true. That's amazing. Um, okay, so let me just um, make myself the presenter here. So um, if, you, if anybody has uh, questions at this point, um, go ahead and enter them into the questions log. And while we give people a minute or two to enter in their questions. I have two quick announcements. Um, so first, coming June 1st, Canada Helps will be launching, officially launching, our new peer-to-peer -peer social fundraising solution. Uh, so charities will be able to launch events like runs and walks and other thons easily. Um, and that, with that, you get extensive branding and customization, reporting options. You can invite team captains um, and participants. You can tell your story with photos um, and a lot more. Really exciting. Um, and if you're interested in more charity education, um, we've launched our first online donor acquisition and retention course, um, very affordably, affordably priced at $45. Um, it comes with four modules, donor acquisition, donor retention, analytics, and social media. And you can learn more about that on Canada Helps. Um, Cynthia, I see some questions coming in here. Um, give me one sec. Oh, Cynthia, what do you mean by a stretch ask? Okay, a stretch gift. Um, then it's it's in a case of of a board member making a stretch gift, is that they're actually stretching their own capacity a little bit and, and having to force themselves into um, a decision. So it's a larger gift than they would necessarily make to um, other charities, but it's to help as well in them understanding the thinking that a donor has to make in order to make an investment. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, we have a question from Katie. Are individuals better off making a specific ask, including dollar amount, or better presenting different options? So that's a good question, Katie, thanks. Um, it depends, and, and just the fact that you said individuals, it just makes me think, I forgot to say that a lot of times uh, we, you know, as I said, we tend to go for special events and let's go to corporations, but in fact what we know is that individuals do give 80% of the money in private sector um, donations. As far as asking for a specific amount, 
if I had seen on another donor wall and based on my research that this individual that we're asking a gift from has made significant gifts, I mean, so this person is a major donor elsewhere, then I'm going to be as strategic as possible and I'm going to ask for an outright gift based on my research. Now that's when the flinch test might come into play because we never know all the facts. If I was just um, involving people that maybe had never given before or they've given under a hundred dollars to our organization, then what I might do is in a, in a fundraising letter, um, on the donor reply form I would have a variety of different levels um, starting usually top down um, and then always having a box for other. So it really depends on whether you've got the ability to research fully and know that this person has given $10,000 to one charity and $5,000 to another and that you know they have the capacity to make a significant gift. Obviously if you're asking for a significant gift you have to have a really strong case for support. So I hope that, that you know it's it's one of those it depends um, uh, responses. Great, thanks, Cynthia. Um, so Frances wants you to know that one change she's going to make um, is uh, spend 15 minutes uh, for board development every meeting by um, having everyone on the board check in, uh, report a good idea encountered, something learned, or a problem that's getting in the way of going forward. Great. Thank you, Francis. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, okay. Um, and um, Ian here says, uh, thank you, Cynthia. I'm new to Canada and new as a board member of one of provincial associations. And I loved how you emphasized importance of involvement in fund development for the entire board and how important it is for fund, uh, sorry, for board members to be donors. Great. Good. Well, thank you for that, Ian. I'm, I'm, I appreciate the reinforcement. Um, okay, Heidi um, would like to discuss more on movers and shakers. What did you mean <laughs> about donors' pages um, and walls, and how else yep. do you find movers and shakers? Well, so Heidi, what I was, what I was um, looking at is if I want to know who who are donors or active people in any community, especially because a lot of times I'm new in a community, then the only way that I can learn that is by by going and reading donor walls. I just encourage all of you to read donor walls because they're quite fascinating. And, you know, go to your local hospital uh, because there's always a donor wall at the local hospital. The local YMCA will probably have a donor wall. Um, at a university, it's less pertinent because it's going to be less local. A lot of times university donor walls are related to, you know, their alumni that are all over the place. Um, but, you know, a theater, um, the, the local symphony orchestra, there's going to be a page in the program that, that's going to list the donors. And if I look at those lists, I don't know whether everyone's still alive or not even, but at least I can see, oh look, at that person gave not only to the hospital and the YMCA, but they're also a board member of the local symphony or the local theater group. And so that's where I can see, that's how I conclude who are the movers and shakers? Who are the key leaders in your community? And who have a proven track record of giving to their organiza to, to other organizations? Because as I say, we're trying to look at people that are donors. We don't try and waste our time on converting non-donors into donors because that just is too time consuming. Okay, I hope that answered that. I thought those are great ideas, Cynthia. Um, Matt, says, as the director of a charity for the past 25 years, two staff, 300 chapters, 5,000 volunteers, um, he has raised all the money over the years, uh, not the board. Is there a way to transition from this model to a board-driven model for fundraising? And he says, I am getting tired, LOL. Ah, yes, understandably. Um, it might be like turning the Titanic. Um, 
and and not to say that you're you'll go down with the ship I hope um, but it's hard because that's that has you've got a long track record and a culture that has kind of put all that responsibility on you and one of the things that I would say to all of you that remain on this call or any of you always encourage that this has to be a team effort in order to succeed Matt that would be a hard um, but not impossible and it's about finding who are the board champions or recruiting some people that understand that this has to be a team effort particularly when you're competing fundraising has changed significantly over the last 25 years and and so um, it's going to be hard it's not good I mean I always say that it takes three to five years to get a solid fundraising program off the ground you may already have a solid one but it, it might be in the category of we've created our own monsters by being really good at what you do all by yourself and then everyone just leaves it on your shoulders and that's so hard to to change that but it's about finding people to work with you that that are like-minded and understand it's time you had a break. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, Francis has a response to your suggestion about the donor walls. Um, he says, donor walls are all yeah. over Salt Spring Islands. We fundraise together for all kinds of public buildings, the new library, the art center, etc. Today is the first time I've ever thought of reading them with eyes open for this purpose. Thanks for <laughs> exclamation marks. <laughs> and I've even been to the Arts Center in Salt Spring, <laughs> and it's gorgeous. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Katie has a question. Are there guidelines around how much board members should donate? Is a percent oper is it a percent operating budget? No. Um, thanks for asking that because that's a really good one. It, you know, you might run into the Royal Ontario Museum or the Art Gallery or some, you know, big institutions that may say that board members are giving, you know, have to give at a certain level. What I encourage right from the start is our goal is to have 100% support from our board members and that might mean a $10 donation from somebody that's on limited income, a $100 donation from, you know, somebody that's got several children in school and a $1,000 donation from someone, you know, bottom line is what I want to boast is 100% support. That's how I'm going to phrase it. That's how United Way phrases it. And, and you know, just for those of you involved in United Way, they're, they're very good at helping people understand that 100% support brings a lot of credibility to outsiders. And I even know major donors that actually will look down a list of board members and look at a list of donors and say, well, if the board member isn't supporting this, why should I? And that's partly because so many major donors have also been board members at a variety of organizations. So I think the message is, you know, really encourage 100% support, but you also have to really treasure the time that they're giving. And I'll just make a note here too, because a lot of times board members are giving a lot of time on more operating activities than governance activities. And part of the staff job and the board job in terms of some professional development is helping people understand what hat am I wearing right now? Am I wearing my governance hat or am I wearing my volunteer staff person hat? Because if I'm wearing my volunteer staff person hat, maybe we could recruit some more volunteers and I could just limit my time to the governance side of things, in which case then I wouldn't feel so torn in, in a lot of directions. And that's, that's always a challenge, but just in the food for thought category. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, the questions just keep coming in. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, okay, um, I guess Sarai has a question here. Is there a typical amount you recommend for board members or staff to personally uh, donate to the organization? And you sort of touched on that earlier. 
Yeah, I mean, that's in the 100% support. And, you know, whether you say within your means or, you know, you, there might be the encouraging of a stretch gift, but I still say it's got to be within your means because, vol I mean, donating to an organization is a voluntary action. And it's not mandatory. It's it's about philanthropy is love of humankind. And, and so it's grounded in... A voluntary action um, but helping people see the value of their gift and and letting them decide that thanks Cynthia um, Stephanie has a question I am part of a very new nonprofit should we be providing a thank you to all donations no matter how much is donated um, yeah I mean I think so I think that that um, because what what we don't know I mean we've got it we have to figure out where do we invest most of our time and there's there's sort of a a comment that that major gift fundraising is an elite contact sport and I would encourage any organization to f be focusing on where is there the most chance of getting a significant gift however um, not at the expense of ignoring people that have just made a $25 gift. Sometimes a major donor sends in $25 just to test the waters and see how you treat them. So again, it's about working smarter, not harder. Don't ever go looking for new donors if you haven't been nurturing the rest of the relationships with your existing donors that's a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush because donor acquisition may cost you a dollar twenty five to a dollar fifty to get a dollar donated and then remember that renewal is twenty to thirty cents to get a dollar so you want to nurture those relationships and that takes thanking your donors there's an expression Kim Klein who used to be the editor of, of the grassroots fundraising journal always said thank before you bank and so you know you have to decide at what level are we going to make phone calls but you, you just be strategic about that according to your own organization Great, thanks, Cynthia. Um, Cynthia, we do have more questions. We can keep going, or um, if you want, I could direct the questions to you after um, this presentation. What yeah, I mean, why don't we take a couple, a, a couple more? And I mean, people have my contact information, um, so you know, I don't mind. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is my business, <laughs> so I'll tell you when the meter starts ticking if it does. But simple stuff. I mean, let's take a few more questions, and and uh, and then you know, people know how to find me if they want. Okay, me. perfect. Um, okay, we have a great question from Gary. Um, which is better as an approach with large gift prospects, asking for a specific amount um, or to pay for a project or large equipment purchase, for example? So again, it, it is, uh, I mean, what I was talking about with, with uh, major gift requests is that I probably would be trying to name a figure or a range, but um, one of the things I know is that no funder likes being the only funder. So the more people that you can demonstrate have invested in this project, people like to back a winner. And so that's where you'll notice that success breeds success. The more investors you have in a project, the more likely you're gonna get more investors. If they see that they're the only funder, that just feels a little bit, you know, all the eggs in one basket. Okay. Perfect. And um, we have a question um, from Sarai. Can you please expand on the challenges you identified at the beginning? Um, for example, asking from corporations and special events, friend raising versus fundraising, and why these are not ideal approaches. <laughs> We might have to have another webinar for that. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've, I have done presentation in the past about special events beyond the bake sale. And, and it's because they are very labor intensive. They burn people out. It is about not working as smartly as one can because they 
don't always raise a lot of money. Some of them do uh, for the larger organizations, but but again, it's just um, it's not where we see the greatest return on investment, and yet it's within people's comfort zone. So that's why it happens is let's have a special event because we can be busy and, and uh, I'm, I'm okay with selling some tickets, but I'm not okay asking someone for you know a thousand dollar donation. So that's the part on the special event side is just how labor intensive and how it burns people out and it wastes a lot of time. Um, not, not to say, I mean that, that as long as it, you know, it's more of an awareness raising thing. So, have you got a, a defined goal as to how are you going to measure the awareness you've raised, that sort of thing? So, it does have a role, but I don't say it's it's a good way to to spend your time. And then on the corporate side, we just know that it's less than 10% of Canadian corporations. Um, are philanthropic by nature. Their bottom line is to disperse their their profits to shareholders, and uh, and so yes, we do get corporate gifts. There's definitely, I mean, if you look at the Imagine Canada's caring companies, we've got those, but it's very hard. Um, again, if you're in a small community, there aren't corporations. You've got local business. The local business is getting asked left, right, and center. So it's just where we have um, approaching individuals, it is about knowing who is our charity's family and potential family, who is motivated by the mission of our organization. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, do you have time for one more? And yeah, then one. I'll forward all the quest the remaining questions to you. Um, okay. So we're talking about engaging the board and, and getting the board engaged. Now, is it possible for a board member to be too involved and what can you do about redirecting micromanagement? Uh, yes, um, well I think again it's it's around uh, whether that has always been the case and whether they've been able to get away with it in the past. The challenge, you know, I, I think that that from the charity side of things and from the staff perspective one of the things I have you ask yourselves is have we equipped our board members to think strategically and have we trained them and do we support their governance role versus their their volunteer staff role um, I sat on a board for five years before I went to York University and studied nonprofit management and learned what my role was. I think notoriously we do not train board members well and so it's not a wonder sometimes that they micromanage because we're expecting the volunteers to do the hardest job which is the future survival of the organization as opposed to you know the the day-to-day -day operations is actually not that difficult so it is about redirecting helping people understand what would be the governance equivalent to that as opposed to the staff equivalent or just saying you know helping people understand what hat am I wearing right now that volunteer staff person or am I wearing my governance hat wonderful thanks so much Cynthia so if anybody has any other questions at all, um, please do feel free to email Cynthia directly. You have her contact information and we'll be um, sending an email within 24 hours to everyone who has registered with a link to the slides and the recording. Uh, Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> thank you. I'm glad that it ran efficiently. It did. <laughs> <laughs> After a few little glitches. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it always works out yeah. in the end. Yeah, and thanks everyone for for signing on as well. Okay, have a great day everyone. Bye.